This is the first video in a series where we're going to cover all the economic data releases that we see coming out each month. We'll be doing these with a particular focus on trading and investing, but this should all be helpful even just for people wanting to know more about economics. We'll kick this off by looking at GDP, that's a country's gross domestic product, because this is one of the most important data points in an economy, and it leads to activity in the financial markets for many reasons, but partly because along with inflation and labour market data, it plays a role in the decision making process for governments and central banks. So GDP is the monetary value of all goods and services produced in an economy within a set period of time. This is typically monthly, quarterly or annually. Now GDP helps inform us of the size of the economy and changes in GDP will show us the rate that the economy is expanding or contracting. In fact, the technical definition of a recession is an economy that's had a fall in GDP for two consecutive quarters. So you can see how it's an important measure. Now there are three common ways that GDP can be measured. There's the expenditure approach, the income approach and the output approach. For now, we're just going to focus on the expenditure approach since it's the one that's most common, but in theory, it shouldn't really matter which approach is being used as they should give a similar outcome anyway. So let's look at how we calculate GDP with the expenditure approach. We can use the following formula. GDP equals consumption plus investment plus government purchases plus imports minus exports. But if we're wanting to compare GDP across different points in time, it's important that we keep in mind another factor in the economy, which is inflation. This is the increase in prices of goods and services in an economy, and it's something we'll discuss in a lot more detail when we have the inflation video that's coming up soon. So we have two ways of looking at GDP with this in mind. We either have real or nominal GDP. This means factoring in inflation or not. Nominal GDP is a measure at current prices, so it's not taking inflation into account. This may be misleading if you're trying to compare an economy over time. For example, if GDP increased by 5%, but inflation also increased by 5%, then the rise in GDP may not be showing growth in the economy. Instead, we may want to use real GDP, which is an inflation adjusted measure of GDP. That way, if, if real GDP has risen 5%, we know that it's more likely to be genuinely showing us stronger economic performance. If GDP is growing and the economy is performing well, we'd expect to see lower unemployment since businesses will be expanding. And that also means that consumers should have more money and higher levels of confidence, which would lead to an increase in consumer spending. Now, consumer spending is particularly important in an economy like the US, for example, it accounts for 70% of the economy. On the other hand, if an economy is slowing or even contracting, Unemployment may increase and the number of available jobs may decrease. Consumers therefore may be less confident and choose to save money rather than spend it. So let's take a closer look at the relationship between these different things and between GDP and the economy. To do this, we can take a look at this basic diagram known as the circular flow of income. This is a simplified model of the economy as a whole and the main part of the diagram that you can see there is called the inner flow and this shows us the basic assumption that income will circulate around an economy. Firms will pay households in the form of wages, dividends and so on. Then households will in turn give the money back to the domestic firms when they consume domestic goods and services and of course domestic means from the same country or the same economy. So the inner flow diagram shows that firms pay out all their money to households and households spend all their money with those same firms. Money goes around and around at the same speed. However, withdrawals and injections into this inner flow can also take place. A withdrawal from a household can happen if they decide to save some of their income. This means that it comes out of the inner flow and gets parked in a financial institution like a bank. It may also be that the household gets taxed and the money is withdrawn from the inner flow and goes to the government instead. Likewise, companies may also do similar things. They may pay tax, unless there are Starbucks, of course, and they may retain their earnings. 
Another type of withdrawal is through imports, like buying foreign goods or paying someone in a different economy. These all contribute to withdrawals from the inner flow. Then opposite to those withdrawals, we have injections. This is where other sources outside the inner flow contribute funds into the inner flow. For example, a firm may borrow money or gain outside investment. These injections may have originally come from the households within the inner flow and that money is now coming back into it. Or it could be that the government is spending money. So we have government expenditure making use of their revenue that's been raised from taxes. So again, it came out of the inner flow as a withdrawal and it's going back in as an injection. Or it may be that there's export income, which offsets the withdrawal from import expenditure. So withdrawals can come from savings, taxes and imports, whereas injections can come from investment, government expenditure and exports. Now, what all of this means for GDP, gross domestic product, is that in very basic terms, if withdrawals are higher than injections, GDP will fall. And if withdrawals are lower than injections, GDP will rise. So at a basic level, that's GDP in a nutshell. Now, as we start to look at other economic data points, you'll be able to refer back to this video and what you understood from this, and begin understanding where there are connections and cause effect relationships between different data points. This is going to be especially useful when it comes to seeing those economic data points coming up in the calendar each month and knowing what it means for other economic data that's coming in the future and what it means for the markets and the economy and so on. So if you found this helpful, please do hit the thumbs up button and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the other videos in this series. The next one will be coming next week. See you then, take care.